Keith Bradby is the CEO of Gondwana Link, an inspirational and inspired project um, stretching uh, across our southwestern uh, part of the continent. He's speaking on behalf of his organisation and also um, Greater Eastern Ranges Initiative, collaborating with Gary Howling, the Executive Director of Great Eastern Ranges. So welcome, Keith. Um, are you with us this afternoon? I am. Excellent. I'll hand over to you right now then. Thanks, Tane. Um, good to be here. Now I'll just, just juggle the, the screen sharing trick. Um, what's going on? Well, he's doing that. Some of you will have um, seen Keith in yesterday's talk uh, with Eugene Eads. Um, that was a very inspirational talk as well. So we're, we're actually familiar with the background setting of your uh, face here. How's that going? The Pretty screen good. Share. Now, have, have we got screen share up? No. No, it's not. Okay. So. Sorry, me and technology, it's a terrible mix. <laughs> we'll get there, guys. Ah, hang on. Now I can. Yes, it's coming now, Bruce. I mean, uh, sorry, Keith. How's that? Very good. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, great to be here, and and great to be sharing with such a a wonderful crew. Even if some of us are, are hiding away from the germs still. I'd um, like to acknowledge I'm down here on Benang Noongar country. Gary's over in Sydney on Gadawal Yuan country and great that the um, Larrakia people have got you all up there. Just a quick point on this um, particular Noongar artwork, the title. That's how I still feel, white man lost in black man's world. We've got to acknowledge we're still, for all the good science that all of you are doing, we're still learning where it is we live. Um, so as, as Tim said, Gary and I have, have bumped our heads together for this talk. I, I would stress we're not so much going to talk about what we're doing and what we've helped achieve and wonderful work happening in both our areas, but the, the whole business of networks and how it, it works across multiple organisations and hopefully we've got some insights that are useful. That's where we are. Um, I'm down here in the southwest. We have a, a thousand kilometre vision of reconnection across where most of the bush is. Gary thought that wasn't ambitious, ambitious enough, so he's taking on the whole east coast. And we also um, swap notes and share a lot with Amon Nathan and the reconnecting Northland crew in the, the top end of the North Island of, of where Bruce is. Um, we're very different places, those three different places, very different populations. Each organisation arrangement has been set up in very different ways. But I can tell you now, when we get together and swap notes, there's so many similarities in, in the, the networking. There's so many sentences we can finish for the other person and um, keen to harvest that level of um, understanding that we've gained. In relation to Australia, I mean, when you talk connectivity restoration, a lot of people instantly click to thinking of skinny little corridors across some sort of harsh, battered landscape. That's not our thinking, and the reality in Australia is it's not how it works. There are some species like the mountain pygmy possum. They've got limited options. The poster child of climate change and, and, and wildlife, I think, they're just being pushed up the hill further. They're losing their snow cover. They've got more foxes to deal with and not as many bogong moths to eat. <clears throat> Over in the West, um, you've got some of the classic Australian opportunistic nomads, I think you'd call them. Um, our ecological management units, Green Australia is very good at spreading seed over the landscape, so are these units. Um, they opportunistically move depending on where food and rain is and can move large distances. And of course, um, the arrival of agriculture and, and our abhorrent um, vermin-proof fences, it's known, 
um, means that we just kill thousands of them every time they try and move. Um, the invertebrates, like the Australian painted lady over Gary's Way, we you know, we're seeing a drop off. We do share some species, like the, the rainbow bee eater that has pretty well defined migratory paths. And then those those who are, are still making their own, the um, white striped free tailed bat, which is now turning up in Tasmania. So he's decided, yeah, the climate's changing. I need to go south where, where Bob Brown can look after me. It is already happening. Um, who are we as, as organisations? We're both very small, three or four staff um, and a few thousand kilometres to play across. So of course we, we try and operate as honest brokers across a wide range of groups, individuals, businesses, researchers, anyone who can help. Um, we stick to some core functions. <coughs> I won't read them out, but I've list, listed some there. We're not trying to do the on-ground work. We're not trying to be the heroes. Um, it, in fact, it generally works best if we if we don't, if we just keep our... Um, a lot of the work we do, we think is almost invisible work and should be invisible work. It's about connecting people, connecting nature, like the shared slogan we have. We do occasionally fill critical gaps when we've identified them, but the aim is to fill them, build a local capacity and then, then, then exit. Um, strategic opportunism, some of us call it. It's a bit like our wildlife. We, um, we move when the opportunity's there and sometimes when you get a blockage and you're working over a large landscape, you can just leave it there for a bit and get on with where you can, can move forward. Um, we are building from, if you like, the old protected area network and the, the refugia there is a recognition of the urgency of rare species conservation, but I'm intrigued with our current conservative national government, how it is, it's almost a placebo you get when you can't fix the big problems across the landscape. It is about um, not dealing with the symptoms, but getting to the causes. And even though we're, um, you know, thinking globally, if you like, it, it has to be built on that detailed local knowledge, local planning, of which there's one example there from Great Eastern Ranges, but, but across our many thousand kilometres, all the critical bits have these detailed local plans built with local people. Um, the larger support groups like ourselves, Greening Australia and so on, involved. Um, I think you know, the, the, the land care movement in particular that, that I've come from and, and still part of has really been given a rough ride with the, you know, how many decades can you keep writing the, the two year funding applications for? We've got to build continuity in the system and we've got to build the ability to have cumulative impact, positive cumulative impact. Um, the classic example we often get is the group to get the, the one or two year project to knock out the weeds. Wonderful work happened here in our Pronger Up Ranges a few years back. And then you don't get any money for another five or 10 years. And what do you know? The weeds regrow and you've got to go for, for another batch of money. Um, I also stress that it's about encouraging groups not to do the things they really want to do, but think hard about what really does make a difference. And there's various planning systems, we use conservation action planning, which is now called something different. Um, but whatever it is that helps people think strategically and doesn't distract them from the geographic bit they're keenest on. Bit of an example of providing continuity. There's a, there's a 1400 hectare property that we spotted in, at, at inception in 2002, um, managed to get it purchased by the National Trust uh, a few years later, Bill and Jane Thompson, the people in that photo, came over from Queensland because they were getting a bit crowded up there and wanted to do some good. Um, and, you know, you then organise how they can get the big grant for the planting and the various contractors and the, the ongoing arrangements they have. Um, and that, by the way, paddock 
um, X paddock they're standing in is three-year-old direct seeding on a restoration basis. Gary, similar, he's a marriage broker. He, he brings all the bits together and um, helps individuals and groups get on and, and do what they want to do and, and source new funding. I think it's really important that we be honest and recognise that it's not all plain sailing. Um, having 30 or 40 groups that you're trying to work across and support and be part of, um, it's a bit like mustering cats and it works really well if you've got a plate of cat food. The money is not always there. We, we try and help groups raise as much as we can. But over time, we, it's about the reciprocal relationships and, and how they're how well they work and, and quite frankly, some individuals, some organisations you can't have reciprocal relationships with, move on. I did want to put up an example of that. Um, we're in, in our 10th year, I think it was, a government funded organisation in the region decided that they could run the Restoring Gondwana program, as they called it. The Commonwealth helped them out with $6 million um, we didn't get consulted, we didn't see a cent of it, but all the groups we work with did. And this, it's almost like the Commonwealth muscle starting to wedge the, um, the cooperation you build. But those groups needed that money. There's not much you can do about it. So sometimes you just grin and bear it and learn a lesson. And that, you know, key, key point here is that often from government and other places, you know, people expect there to be a linear process of change. But you take complex ecologies, complex communities, complex social interactions and market forces, it is not a linear relationship. Um, you can achieve net progress by all sorts of virally moving mechanisms and encouragements and catalysts and businesses, um, but it won't happen the way you plan it out or the way other people think it should be planned out. And look, I, I wanted to enlarge a little bit there. This is um, a guy called Charles Curtin, Science of Open Spaces. He's worked with the, the Melpi Badlands Range Group ranches in Southern Arizona, New Mexico. He's worked with the, um, the main cray fishery and he's worked with the Maasai people in Kenya. And one of his fundamental lessons was You've got to watch out for the people who are using you to make them stronger um, rather than working with you to make your geography healthier and richer. And there are challenges in working out what sort of governance structure empowers locally while having a bigger perspective and, and being managed at a scale that, that is needed. Um, so Gary and I have experience in the in the last few years is changing rapidly. Um, the, the reality of climate change is upon you all, upon us all. Um, people in the East don't need to be reminded of how severe that, that black summer was. Um, I never, never heard remind, to remind people that we've experienced similar in the West. Um, the photo I put in there in our great Western woodlands um, 1.2 million hectare burnt that year. And it, my good mate, Liz Schultz, whose organisation, Nature Conservation, manages an area as big as Tasmania, um, just mentioning. Um, Liz is standing in front of a more than 500 year old water tree, a tree that has been crafted to, to catch and hold water in its bowl. And um, you know, we, we have some urgent work to do. So the jolt of the fires has um, encouraged Gary and I to think way beyond um, some of the mechanisms we were in before. And he might want to talk later about how he's going and we still haven't raised what we need to, to help the Naju. Um, the other jolt we got just as COVID was arising, we've always worked with our farming community and, and most of the, um, the groups, the local groups we work with are farmer based. Um, 
but there's a lot of a lot of ambitious people around and thank goodness we've connected with some of them we work with the evergreening alliance um, with their restorer Pro australia program last year both gary and i were asked if we could work much broader than our natural ecology and there's all these rat bag farmers like ian and di Higgety there um, these guys manage over 100,000 hectares. They're trying to get 30% of it back to, to bush, but they're building the ecology of their soil as well. And it is forms of farming that bedevil me. I, it still doesn't, I'm still not understanding how well it works, but what I do know is it works well. So we now have an alliance um, across the natural ecologists, the farm ecologists, um, a few organisations like Evergreening that, that has great, great promise of driving the decade of ecosystem restoration harder and faster. Um, we do have to ask ourselves, are we a good foundation for scaling up from? Well, our, our brand names seem to be well known. We've, we've hung around long enough and we've put the ambitious approach up there long enough for people to be accepting of transformative change and a certain amount of our support base and our funding base comes in the door now. We don't have to chase it. Proof of concept is out there. Um, in our case, with the assistance of organisations like Green Australia and Ian, there's about 15,500 15 hectares of reasonable quality to good quality ecological restoration. We know how to do it. We know the costings. We know how quickly the wildlife comes back. Um, we know where it should be done. There's enough um, involved, people involved now to transform these landscapes and build that ongoing restoration economy. And we've both got a number of programs to broaden it out into the, the community. As much as what we do is community led and community based, you've got to remember that most of the majority of our communities voted for Tony Abbott and the current Conservative government. So we, we really got to talk to more people than the ones we normally talk to. Thank you, we Keith. Are, That's your time up, I'm afraid. Um, well, and we don't have time. Yeah, I know. Don't have time for questions either. So maybe just well, flip it. through these slides and um, we can talk more later yep. about um, the implications for the UN decade. So thank you so much. Um, Let's, let's thank Keith.